I've flown a number of helicopter sims. I'm a commercial and CFI in helicopters. And to be perfectly honest, everything that's out there commercial outside of the multi-million dollar flight safeties, it's garbage. And yet this thing in prototype stage is way ahead of that. This has been somewhat in the making for about two and a half years. And it was probably about seven or eight months ago we decided, look, we're going to take a run at this market. And part of the reason for that is motion. We seem to know motion pretty well. And we believe that without motion, there's little value in helicopter simulation. And so we've obviously spent a great amount of time developing the motion base for this and something that has come along very, very well. It doesn't look real pretty right now, obviously, and that's why it says very experimental on the side, but it works exceptionally well. A year ago, I thought maybe we had a 15 or 20 percent chance of being successful at that. And right now, I think we're closer to that 85 to 90 percent. So we are very optimistic about our ability to bring this to the market in the not too distant future. And we really think it'll be instrumental in reducing the cost of helicopter flight training. If there is any area where a simulator can make a huge dent in the cost and more important, the efficiency of flight training, it has to be in Hilo. Helos are expensive and they're not getting any cheaper. It's also primarily built around a couple of very basic tasks that are intrinsic to every operation in every helicopter that flies. And what I'm seeing so far, the synergies between the control input, the control reaction, the motion base, and specifically the, the visual ergonomics going with it are extraordinary. I did a quick pickup, ran forward to translation and did a hard quick stop at low level and I felt over amping it even before I saw myself over amping, but it was exactly the same thing I would get if I had done that in an R22. And Jim, you hit it right on the nose as to why the motion is important. You feel it before you ever see it. If you see it, it's too late. And so getting those motion cues correct is frankly the valuable part of creating a system like this. And so that's why there's been so much attention and frankly the type of roller coaster type apparatus you see here in developing an appropriate motion cueing system where you will actually feel it before you see it in the visuals. Rebuilding the sport aviation world one aviator at a time. That's ANN's new Aerosports ebook series, your resource guide to the ultimate in aviation adventures. Aerosport will feature the straight skinny on learning and enjoying 16 unique aviation sports, from ultralights and ballooning to aerobatics, gyroplanes and hang gliders to parachuting, home builds and general aviation to RC models. All this and more will be coming soon with the new updatable Aerosport guide for your favorite electronic devices. Get your advance order in now at www aero-sport.net. Now some of the remarks I've heard about this are kind of intriguing. You're talking about possibly not even certifying it. Absolutely. We'll make that decision in the coming months, but I'm not sure there's a value in that. And the reason for that is we're talking about trying to take out the first six to eight hours of training that everybody has. I mean, everybody knows the, the things that are hard to achieve. You spend the first six or eight hours trying to figure out how to hover, and then you throw in some auto rotation. And if you can develop a level of proficiency in a device like this before you ever get there, you're talking about taking multiple thousands of dollars out of the cost of that training, and that's what it's intended to purpose for. So we are probably not going to call this a simulator. We're going to call it a training device. So where do you go from here? Obviously, you put a lot of time and effort into it. There's been a tremendous investment in resources, but how do you take this to a point where you're interested in making this a commercial product? Okay, we'll take this back to our facilities in Austin, and based on watching people fly it here and some things, we'll go back, we're going to do some software re-engineering, some additional computer performance and stuff. There's one or two slight things we found in the motion platform that we've already got some people taking a look at, so we're very hopeful that, you know, over the next four, five, maybe six months, we'll have something in place that um, we'll feel is production ready. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing and crosswinds. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird X-Wind SE and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulation.com. What kind of investment is a school or a training operation going to look at when something like this comes to fruition? What are you hoping for? We're looking at something like this probably on a cost basis for a training facility, 
sub 200,000. This is a very expensive industry we're in. We're looking at being able to provide devices that are cost effective, that people can actually afford to bring into their training facility. So could we charge more for it? Maybe, but that's not the intent. We're trying to make affordable training devices that will help reduce the overall cost for training. And we hope that not only will it make it less expensive for the owner operators to provide that training, but some of those savings will go back to the actual students themselves. Once this thing is properly developed, are you looking to model it on any types or specifics for the future? Well, since we've got a Bell 47 sitting over there in the corner, yeah, yeah this one's gonna be a Bell 47. But yeah, we will, uh, obviously, due to the preponderance of Robinsons out there, we will look at a SR-22. And if we do decide that we wanna go down the path of certification, then we probably look at a 44 as well for an instrument rated device. To a certain extent, learning to hover is learning to hover, yeah. right? So a, a little bit of helicopter agnostic isn't a bad thing to us, but again, we do realize based on installed base of various types, there will be some different modeling just simply because of the different controls and the inputs on them. So after the Bell 47 is to a point one, then we'll start working on some of those other models. Todd, thanks so much for your time. All right, thank you very much, Jerry.